Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Suneja. I'm the chairman of uh, Cardiology at Houston Methodist West. Uh, I'm honored to be here uh, to welcome Dr. Huey Lin. He's the director of Adult Congenital Heart Program here at uh, Houston Methodist. And I must say that he is not only just brilliant, but he's one of the uh, genius guys who has uh, done phenomenal work for Adult Congenital Heart Program here at Houston Methodist. So here, uh, welcome Dr. Huey Lin. Thank you, Dr. Sineja. We're going to talk today about uh, uh, Tetralogy of Fellow, and we'll start with a, a case presentation. So we have here a 46-year-old uh, African-American uh, lady who presented to our clinic with the multiple episodes of uh, uh, congestive heart failure. Our initial uh, uh, history was significant for uh, congenital heart disease surgery by Dr. the legend, Dr. DeBakey, at the age of five years old when she had surgery done here at Houston Methodist. And uh, her initial workup, uh, which included uh, uh, in non-invasive imaging, revealed that she had a ventricle septal defect and a tretic left pulmonary artery. And later on, ultimately identified as the underlying tetralogy of fellow status post childhood repair. So I'd like you to go and take into the history of uh, this uh, amazing uh, journey of uh, tetralogy of fellow. Yeah. It's quite a triumph because prior to this, um, really nobody dared to actually do any kind of heart surgery. It was thought that heart surgery was impossible. So what we're going to talk about here is this thing called blue babies. So there were these children that we now know are Tetralogy of Fallot patients who were born with a condition that made them cyanotic or hypoxemic. And what that meant was that their skin, their hands, their lips were all blue as a result of having very low oxygen levels and cyanosis. So colloquially, they were called blue babies. And it was known that these kids often did not survive through childhood. Sometimes they didn't even make it through the first year of life because they were so hypoxemic. And so in the 1940s, it was really felt that surgery on the heart was impossible, mm -hmm. that no surgeon should be doing it, that if they did it, it was unethical. So in 1949, Dr. Blaylock, Dr. Thomas, and Dr. Tausig at Johns Hopkins University they conceived of the concept of a shunt that would palliate these patients. And so it was a miracle. It succeeded and it actually allowed these blue babies to no longer be blue. They were actually pink now and move on to the next phase of cardiac surgical history. So in many ways, people think of it as the advent of cardiac surgery period because it allowed for the first time some of these babies who were terminally ill to make it through their childhood. But that's not the end of the story, because the next step was to actually do the intracardiac repair for Tetralogy Fallot. So we're going to go through that briefly, because it really tells us about what's going on with our patient. So here what you're seeing is the major problem with Tetralogy Fallot, and that is that they have an obstruction from the right ventricle out to the pulmonary artery. So that consists of multiple levels of obstruction. So first of all, here outlined in one, you see that there are muscle bundles that are obstructing out the flow of the right ventricle. And then you see that the valve is very small, and then beyond the valve, the pulmonary artery is very small as well. Finally, the other major problem is that they have a communication between the right side, the blue side of the heart, and the, the left side, the red side of the heart, called a ventricular septal defect, or VSD. And that's why these kids are blue. That's why they're called blue babies. So what the surgeon has to do is to resect out those muscle bundles, as you can see here. And then what they have to do is to make that valve orifice as large as possible by slicing through the valve annulus and then often putting a very large patch across it so that this baby can make it all the way through childhood to adulthood. Oftentimes, they'll also have to patch uh, enlarge the pulmonary artery as well. And then finally, of course, they'll have to patch repair the ventricular septal defect. The problem is when you do this, the surgeon often has to disrupt the pulmonic valve. So you can imagine that there's going to be a problem with this. So that leads us to our first continuing education question. Yes, so we will, that's a phenomenal history and journey of uh, Tetralogy of Fallot. So we'll start with the, what problems do adults with tetralogy of fellow patients often have despite surgical repair as a child. Aortic stenosis, cleft mitral valve, severe pulmonary regurgitation and residual pul pulmonary valve uh, stenosis or anomalous pulmonary venous return. And for those of you who said C, you're correct. So that's right. So after that initial repair, as we talked about, many of those patients undergo a transannular patch, which means that the surgeon has to disrupt the annulus of the pulmonic valve and patch it, leaving the valve fully regurgitant. So from the time of their initial surgery, these kids 
are completely incompetent in a pulmonic valve in, uh, in many situations. Like you said, however, there's also the problem that sometimes not only is the valve incompetent, it can be stenotic. Um, and then likewise, they, there can potentially be pulmonary arterial stenoses that are okay for the child when they're children, but once they reach adulthood, it's not adequate for the blood flow to continue going through the pulmonary arterial system. And so let's take a look at our patient. So this is her imaging data. So here you can see a CT reconstruction. Um, so it's a three-dimensional reconstruction of their CT scan. You can see the issues that we're talking about. So we'll look at that more specifically. So you can see that big shelf of white um, right at the bottom of the screen there. That's the transannular patch. So that's where the surgeon had sliced through the pulmonic valve and put that patch on. And now it's become calcified. But more importantly, in this particular patient's situation, she had an atretic left pulmonary artery that was probably good enough when she was a child, but now is way too small as an adult. And you can see it's narrowed down to basically a hair at this point in time. And that's at least part of the problem for what's going on with her. And we would anticipate in her situation, not only does she have pulmonary arterial stenosis, but probably wide open pulmonic regurgitation as we would expect in many of our tetralogy flow patients. So these are fascinating images uh, with the CT scans. I think the imaging technology has clearly made it much, much easier for you to make accurate diagnosis. That's absolutely right. That's right. So this leads us to our second question. Uh, all of these are possible clinical presentations of adults with tetralogy fellow, despite surgical repair as a child, except right and or left-sided heart failure, ventricular tachycardia and sudden death, atrial flutter fibrillation, cerebral aneurysms? And the incorrect answer, if you will, is cerebral aneurysms. That's actually more common with coarctation of the aorta. So this is exactly our problem. Unfortunately, many children and their parents were told that after their initial repair as a child, they are fixed or cured. That's not unfortunately the case. And now we know that because we have about 40, 50, 60 years of history now for tetralogy flow repair. So what that means is just like we outlined here, they can have right-sided heart failure, they can have left-sided heart failure. They can be, because of this chronic pulmonic regurgitation and right-sided enlargement, they can be at risk for ventricular tachycardia or even sudden cardiac death. And then finally, and not exclusively, they can also be at risk for atrial flutter or atrial fibrillation. There are many other things, but these are typically the most common things we worry about. So let's take a look at what happened to our patient. So this is in the cath lab. And what you can see here is that left pulmonary artery is extremely small right at its ostium. And just like you mentioned, we have this excellent technology from the CT scan, which allows us to create a 3D reconstruction. So what we did here is we imported that 3D reconstruction into the cath lab, and that's what you see here. And then we use that to guide the stenting. Because this vessel is so small at its ostium, we were afraid that if we brought it to its size that we wanted it to be, it could potentially tear that vessel. As you can imagine, pulmonary arteries are more fragile than typically systemic arteries, like the femoral artery or the iliac artery or the aorta. And so when we dilate them, we risk having a catastrophic perforation or rupture. And so what we chose to use is this, a fabric-covered stent. So this in particular is great because it allowed us to put a stent in, but also protect against any kind of rupture. So that if there was a rupture, there would not be free bleeding into the chest because there's this fabric covering. And then of course, at the end of it, you see that the stent is widely expanded and it's opened up the vessel the way we would hope it to do. And the goal here is to really try to reduce the pressure in the right ventricle by now allowing blood flow to both the right lung as well as the left lung and giving the patient better cardiac output forward. This is fascinating uh, interventional cardiology in adult congenital heart disease. So That's this right. Is really, I've been an uh, interventional cardiologist uh, for adult cardiology and now seeing this in pediatric cardiology going on all the way to adult congenital heart disease is amazing. Yeah. So this leads us to our question number three. So all of these are potential complications when performing transcatheter intervention on the pulmonary valve and pulmonary arteries, except hemoptysis and airway bleeding, rupture of the pulmonary artery, carotid artery dissection or compression of the coronary arteries. That's right. And hopefully we wouldn't be affecting the carotid arteries at all. So there should not be any effects on the carotid artery. But one of the things that people often don't realize is that the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary valve are right on top of the orifices or the ostea of the coronary arteries. Mm -hmm. 
And it can be either the right coronary artery or the left coronary artery because tetralogy flow often also comes with anomalous origins of the coronary arteries. So when you're doing an intervention, one of the things that many people don't recognize, say when they're putting in a transcatheter pulmonary valve or a pulmonary arterial stent, is that you have to watch very carefully for its effects on the coronary arteries. Because of course, if you compress the coronary artery, that's a catastrophic outcome. And of course, we already mentioned the potential for rupture or perforation of the pulmonary arteries that can, of course, result in hemoptysis or airway bleeding. Great. That's a phenomenal three cases. And I think this would be wonderful to have you to summarize now the tetralogy of fellow findings. Great. Thank you, Dr. Sneja. So because many of our patients who have tetralogy flow have gone through already one, if not two, or possibly even three cardiac surgeries, Transcatheter interventions are really kind of the ideal option, but at the end of the day, as we've talked about today, they are high risk, and they really need to be done within the context of a comprehensive adult congenital heart center within the context of a larger hospital system like ours here at Houston Methodist. Well, thank you, Dr. Hewlin, for an amazing learning experience of a Tetralogy Fellow, and we are really honored to have you here. And as you know, um, Houston Methodist Congenital Heart Program here is one of the finest in the country. We, patient, we take care of patients not just here locally, but take care of patients regionally and all over the country. Patients flying to us here for care for this brilliant team. And uh, uh, we would love you to join us for the Houston Methodist Congenital Heart Awareness Week. And Dr. Hugh Lynn is going to say something. So thank you so much, for Dr. Sinesha, and thank you for all of our uh, supporters throughout the Houston Methodist system. If you're interested in learning even more from patients as well as national experts, please join us at the Houston Methodist Adult Congenital Heart Virtual Symposium, November 7th. You can sign up at the URL below. Thanks. Thank you.